Good evening. Tonight we're going to study about the little horn that changed God's times. And to begin our study, we want to start where we left off last time. Let's begin by turning in our Bibles to the book of Daniel, chapter 2, and verse 21. Daniel, chapter 2, and verse 21. By the way, I believe that this verse is the central verse in all of the book of Daniel. It has the central theme of the book of Daniel. And the verse has three elements that I want us to notice as we begin our study. It says there, speaking about God, and he changeth the times and the seasons. That's number one. Number two, he removeth kings and setteth up kings. Number three, he giveth wisdom unto the wise and knowledge to them that know understanding. Three things. Number one, God changes the times, don't forget that, he changes the times and the seasons. Number two, he removes kings and sets up kings. And number three, he gives wisdom to the wise. And then I want you to notice that the rest of Daniel 2 and Daniel 3 amplify these three points of Daniel 2.21. First of all, God gives Daniel wisdom and understanding to tell the king his dream and what the dream means. Notice Daniel chapter 2 and verse 27. Daniel chapter 2 and verse 27. It says there, Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, The secret which the king hath demanded, cannot the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, the soothsayers, show unto the king. But there is a God in heaven that revealeth secrets, secrets and maketh known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days. Now let's go down to verse 30. But as for me, this secret is not revealed to me for any wisdom that I have more than any living, but for their sakes that shall make known the interpretation to the king and that thou mightest know the thoughts of thine heart. Who gave Daniel wisdom to tell the dream and what the dream means? God did. That's the third element in Daniel 2.21. Now, I want you to notice that the second element is that God places kings and removes kings. Notice Daniel chapter 2, once again, in verses 37 and 38. Thou, O king, art a king of kings, for the God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom, power, and strength and glory. And wheresoever the children of men dwell, the beasts of the field and the fowls of the heaven hath he given into thine hand, and hath made thee ruler over them all. Thou art this head of gold. Who placed Nebuchadnezzar to rule? God did. So you notice two elements. Number one, God gave Daniel wisdom to tell the king his dream and what the dream meant. Number two, God says that he placed Nebuchadnezzar on the throne. Now number three, which is number one actually in Daniel 2 and verse 21, has to do with God changing what? The times and the seasons. Now had God revealed to Nebuchadnezzar how prophetic history was going to flow? Absolutely. He said that there was going to be Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, and then ten kingdoms, and then a little horn from among those kingdoms. And of course, Nebuchadnezzar did not like that scenario at all. Because Nebuchadnezzar believed that his kingdom was going to be an everlasting kingdom. He hated the idea that God's calendar was going to be fulfilled as God had said. So what did he do? He raised up an image like the one he saw in Daniel chapter 2, but with one great difference, and that is that instead of having many medals, it had only one, gold. In this way, Nebuchadnezzar was saying, history is not going to flow the way God says with many kingdoms. History is going to flow as I say, my kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom. Did Nebuchadnezzar try to change God's times? Did he try to change God's prophetic calendar? He most certainly did. But did God change the times of the king? Did God change the prophetic calendar, the counterfeit prophetic calendar of the king? He most certainly did. 
Notice Daniel chapter 3 and verse 28 on this point. It says, Then Nebuchadnezzar spake and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who hath sent his angel and delivered his servants that trusted in him and have what? And have, the very word, and have changed the king's word and yielded their bodies that they might not serve nor worship any god except their own god. So did God change the false prophetic scenario of the king? He most certainly did. God changes the times and the seasons. Does man have a right to change God's prophetic calendar? Absolutely not. Now let's turn in our Bibles to Daniel 7 and verse 25. There's this little horn. And this little horn makes boastful claims. And I want you to notice what we are told about this horn. Daniel 7 verse 25. And he shall speak great words against the Most High. And shall wear out the saints of the Most High. And now notice this. And think to change times and laws. What does a little horn think he can do? He thinks he can change times and laws. By the way, the word think is translated in many versions, he shall intend. He shall intend. Or he shall have the intention of changing times and laws. Now the question is, what does the expression times mean? What are the times that the little horn thought he could change? I looked up the meaning of this word times all throughout the Old Testament. And I discovered that this word, as well as other synonymous words, basically mean a fixed time for an event to occur. A fixed time for an event to occur. In fact, it is frequently used in the Old Testament to describe an established order of events that God has made about how things will develop in the future. In other words, the word times is used to describe events in a sequence in God's prophetic calendar. Which means that if the little horn thinks that he can change the times, he really is thinking that he can change what? God's prophetic calendar or God's order of events. Now I would like to read several verses, both from the Old Testament and from the New Testament, which use this word times. And what I want you to notice is that the word times is employed to describe prophetic events. In other words, when you find the word times, it means prophetic events in God's calendar, events that are going to take place according to God's preset calendar or order. Notice Esther chapter 9 and verse 31 where this uh, word is used, the word times. It says there in Esther 9 verse 31, to confirm these days of Purim in their what? Times appointed. It's talking about the Feast of Purim, which was celebrated from that point on to commemorate the deliverance that Israel experienced in the days of Esther. Was there a specific day when Purim was supposed to be celebrated in God's calendar? Absolutely. And so it says, to confirm these days of Purim in their times appointed, according as Mordecai the Jew and Esther the queen had enjoined them. And as they had decreed for themselves and for their seed. So you'll notice that the word times here is referring to the celebration of a feast which was supposed to take place every year at the appointed time. Notice also Daniel chapter 4 and verse 32. And of course you know that in Daniel chapter 4 we have the story of Nebuchadnezzar uh, going out and eating grass for seven years. In other words, because his heart was filled with, with pride, God humbled him. And he behaved as a beast for seven years. But I want you to notice that in Daniel 4, it does not say that he lost his mind for seven years. Notice Daniel chapter 4 and verse 32. When God predicts what is going to happen to Nebuchadnezzar in the future, we are told this. 
Daniel 4, verse 32. And seven times shall pass over thee until thou know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men and giveth it to whomsoever he will. Does the word times there refer to a future event that God is in control of? Yes or no? Is it dealing with a prophecy about what is going to happen and how long it is going to happen? Absolutely. Notice that the word years is not used. The word times is used. The word that is used in Daniel 7 verse 25. And then of course we have Daniel 7 25 where it says that the little horn will rule for time, times, and the dividing of time. Is that verse speaking about prophetic events? Something that's going to happen in the future? That's been established in God's prophetic calendar? Absolutely. And, it's, and the expression time, times, dividing of time is used. Notice once again the word times refers to events that will be fulfilled in the order in which God has established them. In other words, according to God's calendar. Now, we don't have time to read other passages from the Old Testament, so allow me to read you just a few from the New Testament. The same idea that the word times refers to events that God has ordered according to his prophetic calendar. Notice Acts chapter 1, verses 7 and 8. Acts chapter 1, verses 7 and 8. The disciples come to Jesus and they have a question to ask him. It says here, when they, that is the disciples, therefore were come together, they asked of him saying, they asked Jesus, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? They want to know, is in your prophetic calendar, in God's prophetic calendar, is this the time for God to reestablish Israel? And now notice the answer of Jesus. And he said unto them, it is not for you to know what? The times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. Does God have a prophetic calendar? Does God determine when prophetic events will be fulfilled? Yes. And what is the expression that is used? It is not for you to know the times and the seasons that God has control of, is what this is saying. Once again, the word times refers to future prophetic events in God's calendar. Notice also 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 1. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 1. Here the Apostle Paul is speaking to the Thessalonians about uh, events which will signal the soon coming of Jesus. And he says this, But of the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. What does the Apostle Paul say? Regarding the times and the seasons, I have no need to write to you about it. And then you can continue reading, starting in verse 2. It says, For the day of the Lord will be like the coming of a thief in the night, when they shall say, Peace and safety, sudden destruction will come upon them. Now let me ask you, is this describing a future prophetic event in God's calendar? Most certainly. How does the Apostle Paul describe it? He speaks of it as the times and the what? The times and the seasons. Once again, events in God's prophetic calendar. Notice also Luke chapter 21 and verse 24. Luke chapter 21 and verse 24. Here is a very interesting prophecy. It's speaking about uh, actually the period, the same period of the dominion of the little horn. And we don't have time to go into this prophecy in detail, and that's not the purpose of what we're studying here this evening. We're trying to determine right now what the word times means. But notice how Jesus describes this period of the 1260 years. He says, and they shall fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captive into all nations, speaking about the Jews, and Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the what? Until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Is there an allotted period of time that has been given to the Gentiles according to this? Yes, until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. Notice once again the word times describing prophetic events 
in God's calendar. One final verse from the New Testament, 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 15. Here the Apostle Paul says this, that thou keep this commandment without spot, unrebukable, until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now notice this, which in his times he shall show who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords. Does God have a set time for the second coming of Jesus? Yes, he does. And notice that it is described as in his times he will show this. He will do it according to his own prophetic calendar. So then my question is, what does the word times mean when it is used in a prophetic context? It must refer to the fact that the little horn thinks that he can change God's times or he can change God's prophetic calendar. Are you understanding me or not? The order of events which God has established in which events will flow or will be fulfilled in the course of human history. Is that exactly what Nebuchadnezzar tried to do in Daniel chapter 2 and Daniel chapter 3? Most certainly. Did God give a clear panorama about how history was going to develop? Yes. Did he say there will be Babylon, there will be Medo-Persia, there will be Greece, there will be Rome, Rome will be divided into ten kingdoms, then there will be a little horn, and the little horn will govern time, times, and the dividing of time. Did he clearly delineate how history was going to flow? Yes. But what did Nebuchadnezzar do? He tried to change what? He tried to change the timing of God's calendar. He tried to change the prophetic times. This must mean that the little horn in some way is going to attempt to change the order of the fulfillment of prophetic events. Raise your hand if you're understanding what I'm saying. See, it's so clear when you just look up the word times in Scripture. Now, of course, we need to ask the question, who is this little horn who thought he could change God's prophetic calendar or change the order of events in God's prophetic times. Well, the fact is that by using the method that we spoke about in our first presentation, historicism, it's a piece of cake, so to speak, to identify this power. Let's review Daniel chapter 7. You have a lion. What does a lion represent? The lion represents the kingdom of Babylon, 605 to 539 B.C. Then you have a bear. What does a bear represent? The bear represents the kingdom of the Medes and Persians, governed from the year 539 to 331 B.C. Then you have a third kingdom, the leopard. What kingdom does that represent? Greece. And Greece governs from 331 to 168 B.C. Are there any gaps? any parentheses between one power and another. Absolutely not. It flows continuously without interruption. And then, of course, you have a fourth beast, which is called the nondescript beast. It's actually a dragon beast. And the dragon beast has ten horns. What kingdom does the dragon beast represent? What kingdom came after Greece? It was Rome. I mean, you don't even have to guess at this. All you have to do is go to the history books. And the history books will tell you that this is the way that history actually flowed. Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome. And Rome governed from 168 B.C. to 476 A.D. when the last Roman emperor, Romulus Augustulus, that's a mouthful, isn't it? Actually was the last emperor deposed and the Roman Empire came to, the, to an end in the year 476. In fact, the greatest historian of the Roman Empire, uh, Edward Gibbon, uh, has written a, a masterpiece, several volumes, The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, where he says it was 476 when Rome came to an end. But then what happened with Rome in 476? The barbarian kingdoms came from the north and they carved up the empire. The empire was divided into what? Into ten kingdoms. And once those ten kingdoms are there, what was going to come up among those ten kingdoms where, where Rome had the predominance? The little horn. So let me ask you, 
Who is this little horn which was going to govern for 1,260 years after the empire of Rome was divided into 10 kingdoms? Now listen, folks, all you have to do is look at the characteristics and you're going to know who this power is. Let me just share some of those characteristics with you. First of all, it would have to be a power that arose from Rome because it rises from the head of the dragon beast, and the dragon beast is Rome. So are you understanding why the little horn has to be Roman? Yes. Secondly, it has to arise after the year 476 because it arises among the ten. The ten are already there when the little horn comes out. So it has to arise sometime after the year 476. It has to be a power which persecuted the saints of the Most High, the faithful people of God. It had to be a power which spoke blasphemies against God. And by the way, when the Bible speaks of blasphemies, there are two characteristics in the New Testament which identify blasphemies. One of those characteristics is that a person blasphemes when he claims to have power to forgive sins. Only God can forgive sin. And secondly, an individual speaks blasphemy when being a man, he claims to be what? He claims to be God. In other words, this has to be a system which in some way claims to have the power to forgive sins and also claims to have God's representative where? On earth. Furthermore, it has to be a power that ruled for 1,260 years. This disqualifies one individual as the fulfillment. It has to be a succession of individuals. And finally, this power was going to sit in the church. One of the presentations that we're going to have in this series is 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, where it speaks about the man of sin sitting in the temple of God, showing himself to be God. Well, the fact is, folks, that the temple of God is not the Jewish temple, which is going to be rebuilt in the Middle East. The temple of God, according to the Apostle Paul, is the church. Every time that the Apostle Paul uses this word temple, the Greek word naos, it refers to the Christian worldwide church. It never refers, not once in the writings of the Apostle Paul, to a rebuilt Jewish temple. In other words, this little horn was going to arise not as an enemy from outside the church, but it was going to be a power which would arise within the Christian church. Now let me ask you, how many powers in the world fit this description? There's only one power, folks, and that is the Roman Catholic papacy. Now, am I saying that all Roman Catholics are bad people? No. I've known many Roman Catholics that are nicer than many Adventists. Have you? I'm sure you have. When I speak about the Roman Catholic papacy, I'm not talking about the individuals in the system. I'm talking about the system itself. I'm talking about the organizational structure of Roman Catholicism. I'm talking about the church, not about the individuals within the church. And so there's no doubt whatsoever that this is speaking about the Roman Catholic papacy. By the way, let me just uh, uh, put in a little word of advertising here. I wrote a 132-page document on Daniel 7. There's a lot of historical material. It's a treasure house of material. And you can download that from our website, www.secretsunsealed.org. And we don't charge anything to download. Everything we put on our website, you can download for free. Isn't that nice? I don't hear any amens here. I guess we better charge. <laughs> Go there. Read the 132 pages. I go through the characteristics of this little horn step by step. There's no doubt that it's referring to the Roman Catholic papacy. Let me ask you, did the Roman Catholic papacy arise from Rome? Of course it did. What is it called? The Roman Catholic Church. What is its language? Latin. Where is its capital? Rome. The Vatican. Did the Roman Catholic Church persecute the saints of God? Oh, yes, millions of people perished at the hands of the Roman Catholic system. Does the Roman Catholic Church claim to have the right to forgive sins? It most certainly does. Does it claim that it has a representative of God on earth? Yes. 
Does the Roman Catholic Church, uh, is it within the church structure? Is this some enemy atheistic power that attacks the church from outside, or is it a power that arises within the church? It's a power within the church. Let me ask you, did the Roman Catholic papacy govern for 1,260 years? Absolutely, from 538 to 1798. In 1798, the power of the papacy was removed when General Berthier went into the Vatican and took the Pope off of his throne and took him prisoner to several cities, ending up finally and dying in France. The civil power of the Roman Catholic system had been removed, and we'll talk about this a little bit later on. So what did the papacy do? According to Daniel chapter 7 and verse 25, it says that he would think or he would intend to change what? The times and what? And the law. Now, let's deal, first of all, very briefly with the law. Does the Roman Catholic Church claim to have changed God's holy law? They openly claim it. I mean, you don't even have to read between the lines. It's very clear. First of all, if you go to a Roman Catholic catechism, you'll find that the second commandment is not there. The one about uh, worshiping images? I went one day and I examined one catechism right after another. The second commandment isn't in there. So that's one change in God's law. But there's, but there's another change which is even greater than that. Which day do Roman Catholics keep as the day of worship? They keep Sunday as the day of worship. Do you know why they keep Sunday as the day of worship? Allow me to read you a few statements from Roman Catholic sources. By the way, if you go to the website, you'll find about 15 pages of quotations from Roman Catholic books. So I'm just going to give you an inkling of what we're talking about here. Here's one. Why did the church change the Lord's Day from Sabbath to Sunday? Here's the answer. The church using the power of binding and loosing which Christ gave to the Pope changed the Lord's Day to Sunday. Who changed the Lord's Day to Sunday? The Roman Catholic Church. They themselves say so. And notice the use of the word change twice in that quotation. Here's another one. The church, on the other hand, after changing the day of rest from the Jewish Sabbath or seventh day of the week to the first, made the third commandment refer to Sunday as the day to be kept holy as the Lord's Day. I thought the keeping of the Lord's Day was the fourth commandment. But they're saying, after we changed the day from Saturday to Sunday, we made the third commandment apply to the day of rest. Who has a right to change God's holy law? It says that the little horn would think to change God's what? God's law. Here's another quotation. The Jews' Sabbath day was Saturday. We Christians keep Sunday holy. Now the question is why? Here's the answer. The church, by the power our Lord gave her, changed the observance of the Saturday to the Sunday. The church, this is a Roman Catholic scholar writing here, says the church by the power our Lord gave her, changed the observance of the Saturday to the Sunday. I'll read one more before we get to the times. What Bible authority is there for changing the Sabbath from the seventh to the first day of the week? Who gave the Pope authority to change a command of God? If the Bible is the only guide, remember this is a Roman Catholic writing, if the Bible is the only guide for the Christian, then the Seventh-day Adventist is right in observing the Saturday with the Jew. But Catholics learn what to believe and do from the divine, infallible authority established by Jesus Christ, the Catholic Church, which in apostolic times made Sunday the day of rest to honor our Lord's resurrection on that day and to mark off clearly the Jew from the Christian. Is it not strange that those who make the Bible their only teacher should inconsistently follow in this manner the tradition of the church? This is only a few, sa a few samples 
of quotations from Roman Catholic sources, from Roman Catholic scholars themselves, where they say, we, the church, changed Sabbath to Sunday. And they use the very word changed, which is used in Daniel chapter 7 in verse 25. But now we need to ask the question, in what sense did the Roman Catholic system change God's times? In what sense did the Roman Catholic Church change or attempt to change God's prophetic calendar, God's order of prophetic events, the sequence in which the events of history would be fulfilled? How did the Roman Catholics do this? In order to understand how they did it, we must comprehend, first of all, the beliefs of the Protestant Reformers. You see, during the Protestant Reformation, there were entire countries that withdrew their support from the Roman Catholic system. We know the most famous reformers like uh, Martin Luther and John Calvin and Ulrich Swingley, but there are many other reformers. And all of these reformers had one point of view in common, and that is that the Roman Catholic system was the predicted antichrist of Bible prophecy. In fact, they had several ideas that they shared. Let me just share those with you. Number one, the Protestant reformers taught, and by the way, in, uh, I also have another document on the webpage, which is called The Changing of the Times. And you'll find not only uh, the reformers in general, but you'll find page after page after page after page of quotations from known reformers and from lesser known reformers, where they clearly identify the papacy as the Antichrist. It's an overwhelming amount of evidence. There's no way around it that Protestant reformers believed that the Antichrist of prophecy was the Roman Catholic system. Number one, they believed that the fourth beast of Daniel 7 was a symbol of the Roman Empire. We've already talked about that. Number two, they believe that the famous restrainer of 2 Thessalonians 2, know that there's a restrainer that was holding back the Antichrist from being manifested? But when the restrainer would be taken out of the way, then the Antichrist would show up and he would reveal himself. The Protestant reformers, without exception, believed that the restrainer of 2 Thessalonians 2 was the Roman Empire. They believed that it was the Roman Empire, while it was governing, that kept the Roman Catholic papacy from revealing itself. But when, the Ro when Rome gave the papacy its civil power, the restrainer was taken away, and now the papacy ascended to power. They believed that the restrainer of 2 Thessalonians 2 was the Roman Empire. Number three, they believe that the Antichrist is not an individual but a succession of popes who taken together constitute an apostate religious system. In other words, they, they didn't believe that the Antichrist is one individual. They believed that the Antichrist is a system composed of a succession of rulers and that the entirety of it throughout the whole history of it is the Antichrist. In other words, the Antichrist was not one single individual. Number four, they believe that the time periods of Daniel 7 were symbolic. In other words, they did not believe that time, times and the dividing of time means three and a half literal years. They, they applied the year day principle. In other words, they believed that when prophecy spoke about a year, it meant what? A day, excuse me, it meant what? A year, a day for a year. So 1,260 days would be 1,260 what? 1,260 years. Number five, they believed that the temple in which the Antichrist was to sit was not the Jerusalem temple, but was the Christian church. Number six, they believed that the word Antichrist did not denote some blasphemous individual, some atheist who was going to attack Christianity from outside, but the word Antichrist really means someone who is going to oppose Christ by posing as Christ. And finally, although not unanimous, the majority of the Protestant reformers believe that the little horn of Daniel chapter 7 represented the Roman Catholic system. 
And so the Protestant reformers, they would take the Bible, they would take 2 Thessalonians 2, they would take Daniel 7, they would take Revelation 13, uh, they would take the abomination of desolation, Matthew 24, the harlot of Revelation 17. They would take all of these prophecies and they would say, all of the characteristics fit the Roman Catholic papacy to a T. Let me read you just two statements, one from Martin Luther and the other from John Calvin. By the way, as I mentioned, you, you can find in the writings of Wycliffe, Tyndale, Swingley, Knox, John Wesley, even the famous scientist Isaac Newton identified the papacy as the Antichrist. But allow me to read you from Martin Luther. He says this, I am practically cornered and can hardly doubt anymore that the Pope is really the Antichrist, whom the world expects according to a general belief, because everything so exactly corresponds to the way of his life, action, words, and commandments. Luther says, I have no doubts that the papacy is the Antichrist because of its life, action, words, and commandments. Allow me to read you a statement from John Calvin, probably the second most famous Protestant reformer. He says this, Some people think us too severe and censorious when we call the Roman pontiff Antichrist. But those who are of this opinion do not consider that they bring the same charge of presumption against Paul himself, after whom we speak and whose language we adopt. I shall briefly show that Paul's words in 2 Thessalonians 2 are not capable of any other interpretation than that which applies them to the papacy. Did the Protestant reformers have any doubts as to the identity of this little horn who thought he could change the times and the law, the man of sin, the abomination of desolation, the harlot of Revelation 17? Absolutely not. They had it crystal clear. Do you know how they knew it? Because they knew that Babylon had passed, Medo-Persia had passed, Greece had passed, Rome had passed. By, by their time, they knew that, the, that Rome had been divided into ten kingdoms. So they said, if Rome was divided into ten kingdoms in 476, and the Antichrist rises among those ten kingdoms, he has to be here. Are you with me? In other words, they used the historicist method to identify the Antichrist. They didn't guess. They didn't speculate. They saw it right before their eyes. And of course, the Roman Catholic Church began losing not only individuals, but whole countries became Protestant. Allow me to read you a statement from the book of Leroy Edwin Froome, who wrote a prophetic masterpiece composed of four volumes, The Prophetic Faith of Our Fathers. He spent years traveling throughout Europe and studying in the great libraries of several countries in Europe, investigating the issues of how prophecy was interpreted throughout the course of the history of the Christian church. And he says this about the accusing finger which was pointed by the reformers to the Roman Catholic system. He says in Germany, Switzerland, France, Denmark, Sweden, England, and Scotland, there had been simultaneous and impressive declarations by voice and pen that the papacy was the specified antichrist of prophecy. The symbols of Daniel, Paul, and John were applied with tremendous effect. Hundreds of books and tracts impressed their contention upon the consciousness of Europe. Indeed, it gained so great a hold upon the minds of men that Rome in alarm, saw that she must successfully counteract this identification of Antichrist with the papacy or lose the battle. And so Rome began its counterattack. The first step was the establishment of what is known as the Society of Jesus, also known as the Jesuits, by a Roman Catholic priest, his name, Saint Ignatius Loyola. 
He established the Society of Jesus or the Jesuits with the express purpose of counteracting and destroying the Protestant Reformation. In fact, you know, I had the privilege of visiting St. Peter's Basilica in Rome, and as you walk up towards the altar in that tremendous, huge basilica, on the left-hand side there's this statue of St. Ignatius Loyola with, with uh, the, uh, a book with the traditions of the church in his hand, and his foot is on the neck of a Protestant, trampling the Protestant. That's the reason why he established the Society of Jesus, was to counteract the Protestant Reformation. Then, of course, the Roman Catholic Church called a church council, the Council of Trent. It's the longest church council ever held in the history of the Roman Catholic Church. It was held from 1545 to 1563. And the purpose of this council was to reaffirm every dogma of the Roman Catholic Church and to pronounce curses against all of those who did not believe the message of the church. Well, it just so happens that two scholars from the Society of Jesus or from among the Jesuits <coughs> decided that the best way to counteract the Protestant Reformation was to counteract the way in which they interpreted Bible prophecy. You see, by the method that the Protestant Reformers used to interpret Bible prophecy, everybody could see who the Antichrist was. And so these scholars, these Jesuit scholars said, we have to devise systems of prophetic interpretation that deflect the finger from Rome and point the finger elsewhere. And here you can enter a man by the name of Luis de Alcázar, Jesuit from Seville, city in southern Spain. From 1569, remember the Protestant Reformation officially began in 1517 when Martin Luther uh, nailed his 95 Thesis to the, the cathedral door in Wittenberg. So this is in 1569, shortly after the Protestant Reformation uh, started. He began writing a 900-page commentary, and the name of the commentary is An Investigation into the Hidden Sense of the Apocalypse. And do you know what he did? He used a preterist approach to the interpretation of the prophecies of Revelation as well as of Daniel. He said this idea that this little horn of Daniel chapter 8 and 9 represents the Roman Catholic papacy cannot be true. In fact, it isn't true. That little horn actually represents a nasty individual who lived in Syria and ruled over Syria. His name was Antiochus Epiphanes. You see, he came to Jerusalem, he uh, sacrificed a, a swine or a pig on the altar, he killed the high priest Onias, he persecuted the Jews, he changed their religious calendar, and so the prophecy about that little horn can't refer to the Roman Catholic system because it refers to Antiochus Epiphanes. Furthermore, he said the prophecies of Revelation that beast of Revelation 13, that doesn't represent the Roman Catholic papacy. The harlot of Revelation chapter 17, that doesn't represent the papacy. He says the harlot represents the apostate, apostate Jewish people and their city, the destroyed destruction of their city in AD 70. As for the beast of Revelation 13, that beast who died and then his resurrect to newness of life uh, actually represents Nero because there was this tradition that Nero had died but that he was going to come to life again. So he says that beast really was Nero and the little horn was Antiochus Epiphanes. Now you tell me, if the little horn reigned 165 B.C., and if all of the prophecies of Revelation were fulfilled with the destruction of Jerusalem in A.D. 70 and with Nero and the early Roman emperors, do any of these prophecies apply to the Roman Catholic system? Absolutely not. He's saying they don't apply to our time, they apply to the distant past. In this way, he deflected the finger to the past and took away the finger from the Roman Catholic papacy. 
By the way, do you know that today, and we're going to get into this in our next study together, do you know that today there's a huge segment of Protestantism that has this preterist approach to Bible prophecy? They're liberal Protestants. They are Protestant scholars who do not believe in the inspiration of the Bible. You say, is there such a Protestant? Oh, yes. I went to Andrews University several years ago, and I, and I did some research in the library. I was amazed at how few commentaries actually believe that Daniel wrote the book of Daniel in the 6th century B.C. Almost every commentary that I read said Daniel didn't write Daniel. Actually, somebody wrote it in the 2nd century in the time of Antiochus Epiphanes, and they put Daniel's name on it. Because these liberal scholars don't believe that there can be such a thing as predictive prophecy because that would involve a miracle. And so in Protestantism, and by the way, in that document, The Changing of the Times, that you can see on the webpage, I give examples from modern commentaries, Protestant commentaries, where they use this very method. They say that the little horn is Antiochus Epiphanes and the beast of Revelation 13 is Nero. Where did they get it from? Hmm. From Luis del Cazar and his successors. But then there was another Je Jesuit scholar. Notice that Luis del Cazar was a Jesuit. There was another Jesuit scholar that disagreed with Luis del Cazar. His name was Francisco Rivera. He was a teacher, a theology teacher at the University of Salamanca in northwest Spain. He joined the Jesuit order when he was 33 years old. He also wrote a 500-page commentary. By the way, he died when he was only 54 years old. He was a scholar and a writer. He wasn't a preacher. In other words, his views were contained in writing. Rivera said, Alcázar is wrong. You see, this little horn prophecy is really not talking about Antiochus Epiphanes who ruled way back 165 B.C. Uh, the prophecy of the beast of Revelation 13 does not represent Nero, who, by the way, was the one who beheaded the Apostle Paul. He gave the, the, the order to behead the Apostle Paul. He says, no, it's the wrong approach. He said, actually... The little horn represents a nasty individual who will arise at the very end of Christian history. He will rebuild the Jewish temple. And then he will sit in that Jewish temple and he will demand worship. And he will rule for three and a half literal years in the temple. And he will oppress the Jews. Allow me to read you Leroy Edwin Froome's description of this scholar. He says this, Ribera ascribed to a literal three and a half years reign of an infidel antichrist who would bitterly oppose and blaspheme the saints just before the second advent. He taught that antichrist would be a single individual who would rebuild the temple in Jerusalem, abolish the Christian religion, deny Christ, be received by the Jews, pretend to be God, and conquer the world. And all in this brief space of three and one half years. Do you know what else Ribera did? He severed the 70th week of Daniel from the first 69. He was the first, as far as we know, to establish a parenthesis between week 69 and week 70 of the prophecy of the 70 weeks. That's what conservative Protestants teach today. Where did they get it from? As I mentioned to you, Rivera was a scholar. He wasn't a preacher. He wasn't really an eloquent teacher. And so he needed someone who was eloquent. He needed an apologist to share his views far and wide. And this evangelist was found in a man called Robert Bellarmine, Cardinal of the Roman Catholic Church, 
one of the greatest Jewish uh, Jesuit apologists. By the way, do you notice that all these individuals were Jesuits? Luis de Alcázar was a Jesuit. Francisco Rivera was a Jesuit. Robert Bellarmine was a Jesuit. In fact, Bellarmine wrote a book entitled Polemic Lectures Concerning the Disputed Points of Christian Belief Against the Heretics of This Time. He wrote that between 1581 and 1593 trying to totally debunk everything that was taught by the Protestant reformers. As far as he, we know, he was the first individual to establish a gap between the fourth beast of Daniel 7 and the ten horns and the little horn. Isn't this interesting? Rivera establishes a gap between week, week 69 and week 70. And he also says that the fourth, fourth beast is Rome, but then the fulfillment of that prophecy stops. There's a long parenthesis, and then at the end of the age, you will have the ten horns and the little horn. Do you know that that is exactly what Protestants are teaching today in their prophetic scenario? Where did they get it from? Hmm. You see, Bellarmine said, the Antichrist prophecies call for an individual, but the papacy is a system. He says, see, the, the Antichrist is an individual, the papacy is a system, so the papacy can't be the Antichrist. He said the time periods must be literal, but the papacy hasn't governed three and a half literal years. It's governed for centuries. In fact, he said Antichrist is going to sit in the Jerusalem temple. The Pope sits in Rome. So he can't be the Antichrist. Now what exactly is Ribera doing? He's projecting all of these Antichrist prophecies where? To the future. Right before the second coming of Jesus. So if these prophecies are fulfilled in the distant future, are they being fulfilled in the days when the Protestant reformers lived? No. So one scholar, one Roman Catholic scholar, projects everything to the past Primarily the Antichrist prophecies were fulfilled in the past. The other says they, were fulfilled in the they will be fulfilled in the distant future. And the whole intention is to get people to look backwards and forwards so that they cannot see the present fulfillment in the days of the reformers of these prophecies. Are you understanding what I'm saying? Let me just read you from Bellarmine himself. He says, For all Catholics think thus, that the Antichrist will be one certain man. But all heretics teach that Antichrist is expressly declared to be not a single person, but an individual throne or absolute kingdom, an apostate seat of those who rule over the church. In other words, uh, the Roman Catholic Church teaches that the Antichrist is going to be a person, whereas the heretics teach that it's going to be a system. Here's another quotation. Antichrist will not reign except for three years and a half. But the Pope has now reigned spiritually in the church more than 1,500 years. Nor can anyone be pointed out who has been accepted for Antichrist who has ruled exactly three and one half years. Therefore, the Pope is not the Antichrist. Then the Antichrist has not yet come. He says there's no pope that ruled exactly three and a half years, so the papacy can't fulfill this prophecy because he's taking the time as what? Literal. He's taking the, the Antichrist as an individual. One further quotation from him. The pope is not Antichrist, since indeed his throne is not in Jerusalem, nor in the temple of Solomon. Surely it is credible that from the year 600, no Roman pontiff has ever even been in Jerusalem. So the Pope has never sat, sat in the temple in Jerusalem, so he can't be the Antichrist. Are you understanding the methodology that he's using? He's trying to counteract the Protestant Reformation by a counterfeit interpretation of Bible prophecy, pointing to the future or to the past so that it cannot be discerned what is happening in the present. And do you know what? Protestants today are repeating the same error particularly since 9-11. We're going to talk more about 9-11. Why do you suppose the Middle East is so in so much in turmoil? Why the Palestinians and the Jews at each other's throats? 
Why do you suppose that, that uh, fundamentalist Muslims were the ones that, that perpetrated that terrible terrorist act of 9-11? Of One of the reasons is because Satan wants everybody to look where? He wants everybody to look over there. Oh yes, our teachers have been teaching us that the Antichrist is going to sit over there in the Middle East. That's what this battle is all about. And you'll find book after book after book in bookstores. Believe me, I visit every so often bookstores. Every single book on Bible prophecy, almost. There's a few preterist ones, but not very many. Almost every single book says that the Antichrist is future. He's going to sit in a literal rebuilt Jerusalem temple, and he's going to reign for an ex exactly three and a half literal years after the church has been raptured to heaven. Does that sound familiar? If that's true, is the Roman Catholic Church the Antichrist of prophecy? No. Does the devil want to hide the true Antichrist? Does he want to hide who really changed the law? Does he want to hide who really changed the times? He most certainly does. Now listen up as we draw this to a conclusion. For about 300 years after the Protestant Reformation began, Protestantism remained firm as a rock in their method of interpreting Bible prophecy. They were historicists through and through. And you can see it in this document that I wrote. They constantly attacked these Jesuit scholars who were trying to change the prophetic scenario. But in the early 19th century, Protestantism experienced, experienced a shift and an abandoning of its prophetic roots. We're going to study that in our next lecture. We're going to study the sad story of how the prophetic views of Luis de Alcázar and the prophetic views of Francisco Rivera were transferred to Protestantism in the most unlikely way in the Church of England. And we're going to see how these ideas was tra were transported from England to the United States and have practically taken over the whole Protestant world. You see, through preterism and futurism, the Roman Catholic Church has hijacked Protestantisms. And most of what Protestants teach today comes directly from the Roman Catholic Counter-Reformation. And let me share this with you. Do you know that many Protestants are wanting to join with the Roman Catholic Communion? Billy Graham calls the Pope the greatest moral leader in the world. He's a Baptist. Robert Schuller says, I hope someday the whole Christian world, I'm going to give you, give you these quotations later on in this series, uh, I hope that someday the entire Christian world will accept the Pope as its leader. Paul Crouch of TBN, I have the date and the time when he said it. He says, I'm deleting the word Protestant from my vocabulary. Lutherans and, Lutherans and Catholics signed a joint declaration on righteousness by faith, saying that the Protestant Reformation was a mistake because Catholics and Protestants agree on justification by faith. Protestant scholars, prominent Protestant scholars, and Roman Catholic scholars sign a document called Evangelicals and Catholics Together saying, let's just join forces and evangelize the world together. Do you think that if these Protestants realized that the Roman Catholic system is the predicted antichrist of prophecy, they would be so anxious to join? No. no. Why are they anxious to join? Because they have lost their prophetic roots. They cannot see that Roman Catholicism as a system is fulfilling prophecy. They cannot see that the United States of America, that second beast of Revelation 13, is now fulfilling prophecy 
right before their very eyes. They can't see it because they're looking for the fulfillment of prophecy in the wrong place and at the wrong time. So let me ask you as we conclude this evening, did the Roman Catholic papacy attempt to change God's prophetic calendar? The order of events which God has established? Yes. Did they do something similar to what Nebuchadnezzar did? Absolutely. Trying to change the order and sequence of God's prophetic events. But I praise God that God is going to have the last word. Amen. And he's going to let the whole world know that he is in control of the times and the seasons. And he will have a remnant that will stand before these religious systems and they will be faithful to God though the heavens fall. I pray to God that we will all be among that group. Father in heaven, we thank you for the privilege of studying these things this evening. I know that some of these things might come across as being harsh. Father, that's not the purpose. I hope no one's offended by what I've said this evening. You know that I love everyone here, but it's because of love that I must share these things. Lest people be found on the wrong side in the great controversy which we're entering upon now. Oh, Father, I ask that you, will, that you will help us feel that intense longing desire, that hunger and thirst for truth. And that through your Holy Spirit, you will give us the strength to live the truth, though the heavens fall. I thank you, Lord, for having been with us and for hearing our prayer. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Tomorrow night.